So hey everyone, I'm here to talk today about something of epic proportions, so incredibly complex that some even consider it more complex than our own galaxy. So I'm of course talking about this, the human brain. So before you accuse me of exaggeration, let me substantiate my previous claim. It is estimated that there are more synaptic connections in the brain, that is connections between brain cells in the brain, than there are stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Furthermore, the number of possible combinations of these connections actually outnumbers the number of elementary particles in our universe. So clearly this is a perplexing hunk of matter, and the study of this is called neuroscience. Neuroscience is just in its infancy, and it's just beginning to take off because we just now have the technology we need to truly investigate it. So what we need now are young, motivated neuroscientists ready to take the wheel. So today I'm going to share with you some ongoing research, some interesting tidbits in neuroscience right now in an effort to entice you to pursue a career in neuroscience, or at least gain a better appreciation for that organ that sits in the top of your head. So we'll start here. This is my precious dog, Flora. I think she's absolutely adorable. Judging by your awes, I think you do too. Why do I think she's so cute, though? So neuroscientists have actually found a chemical in the brain called oxytocin, which they believe is associated with, with bonding and trust. So oxytocin is only found in mammals, and it becomes very active during certain times. So for example, when a woman goes into labor, her oxytocin levels actually spike, which is thought to facilitate bonding between the mother and the infant. Also, if you give someone a dosage of oxytocin, they tend to rate pictures of people's faces as more trustworthy than the, if they haven't been given the dosage of oxytocin. So what does this have to do with flora? Well, neuroscientists did a study where they allowed pet owners to interact with their pets for anywhere from 5 to 24 minutes, and they measured the oxytocin levels. And they found that when you get to play with your pet, your oxytocin levels actually increase. And interestingly, the dog's oxytocin levels increased as well. So the next time you can't resist your pooch's puppy dog eyes, you can blame it on oxytocin. <laughs> so what happens before I recognize Flora and get the spike in oxytocin? A lot of people think of vision as sort of a camera. It just passively reflects the world around us. But that's not true. It's really complex. In fact, vision is so specialized that neuroscientists have discovered areas that react to certain objects. So the FFA, the fusiform face area, becomes very active when we're looking at faces. And the PPA, the parahippocampal place area, becomes very active when we view places. Great, but so what, right? So we talked a little bit about Ryan reading today. What if I told you that neuroscientists were mind readers? Except our machine doesn't look like a crystal ball. It looks like this. This is a magnetic resonance imaging machine. Some of you may have seen it or actually had a scan in an MRI before. What we can do with this is truly amazing. So in 2005, neuroscientists did a study where they taught a brain to recognize whether a person was looking at 45 degree or 135 degree angle lines. Then they put participants back in the MRI and showed them this crosshatch circle on the bottom. And based solely on the output that they picked up from the brain scans, they were able to tell whether the person was paying attention to the 45 degree or the 135 degree lines. Fast forward several years to a recent study, neuroscientists showed people pictures of faces, actually these faces under the original column. Then what they did is they took scans of the people and used the scans and the output from the brain to reconstruct what the people were seeing after they had taught the computer how to read people's, read people's minds. <laughs> so you can see here that the reconstructions are really close to what the actual faces look like, which is really great. <laughs> and the implications for this are really exciting. Maybe someday we can put you in an MRI, tell you to think of your favorite work of art, and be able to tell whether you're thinking of Starry Night or Mona Lisa. So what happens after you see something? A lot of this information enters your memory. One process in memory is called working memory. So you may be familiar with short-term memory. That's the temporary storage of information. Working memory is this, but in addition, you're able to manipulate and perform operations on that. I like to use this analogy. How many of you have one of these in your pocket right now? Maybe not an iPhone, maybe a droid. I don't discriminate. <laughs> so a oh, smartphone stores all your emails and texts and Snapchats and tweets, but you can also manipulate the information. You can send it and copy it and paste it. And it also takes a lot of working memory to operate one. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a quick working memory test. So you'll see a math operation on the screen and then a letter, another math operation letter, so on and so forth. Do the math operations to the best of your ability. I promise this is the only math in my entire presentation. And then try to remember the letters. Ready? All right. Ready. 
These were the letters. <laughs> Who got them all right? Anybody? Yeah. So this is actually one trial from a working memory test that neuroscientists use. It's called the operation span. And what it, we can tell from this test is truly amazing. So performance on working memory tests like these have actually been linked with your GPA, with IQ scores, reading comprehension level, SAT scores, even moral judgments. And deficits have been linked with disorders like ADHD. So it's a simple, quick process. It's a simple, quick system. But it can tell us a lot about how people differ from person to person. So I've been talking a lot about normal brains. I work with normal brains. But usually when people hear neuroscience, they think about the more clinical medicinal side of things. Maybe you picture a neuro neurosurgeon operating on a brain. So I'll share with you a huge burgeoning field on the clinical side. So I go to an SEC school. So Saturdays in the fall for an SEC school mean, anybody? Football, Football right? So the study of traumatic brain injury, subconcussive hits, concussions, or some people would consider them mild traumatic brain injuries, is a huge field right now because there's a lot of controversy surrounding it. The big question of the day is, do concussions produce long-lasting permanent effects, effects that may lead to chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the disease that a few of the retired NFL players have developed? Or is it a concussion more of a transient state? Maybe it induces some sort of quick metabolic changes, but they're pretty much resolved within the week. We still don't have a definitive answer to that question. Imaging can provide us some clues. So these are what are called diffuse and tensure imaging scans. They're from an MRI, and they sort of map the connectivity in the brain. So in the normal brain, in the normal brain, you want a lot of good, healthy connections going to the top and the bottom of the brain. But in this traumatically brain injured patient, you can see a lot of these connections have been sort of sheared off or severed somehow. So this can give you a really good idea of how diffuse and global the damage is from traumatic brain injury. And I will say, Traumatic brain injury, this patient is not necessarily a football player. I don't want you thinking if you play football, your brain looks like this. The two major causes of traumatic brain injury are falls and motor vehicle accidents. So <laughs> clearly it's a complex injury, and we really need to understand it because we need an answer to these questions. So in summary, neuroscience is a growing field. We've learned a lot, but there's so much more we need to know. Neuroscience still needs its Sir Isaac Newton, or its Marie Curie, or its Watson and Crick. Because as Francis Crick himself said, there's no study, scientific study, more vital to man than the study of his own brain. Our entire view of the universe depends on it. Thank you.